Again, wrasses were the most diverse, seven species of wrasses on the outside here, but we also had some gobies, some uh, microdesmids, and also very, very small uh, dragonets or calionemids. So a lot of what's in here are really sand or sediment associated fishes. We recorded three species in Decipian's meadows of potential recreational importance. Um, two of these were the goat fishes, Molodicthes flavoliniatus and Peripenius multifasciatus. Again, the seagrass meadow is really close to a large artificial reef. So what effect that has on the abundance of these species is unclear. Um, a third species, a snapper, uh, the tape, was also found uh, in pretty high densities in and around the seagrass meadow um, for Halophila decipiens at the sea tiger site. It should be remarked we didn't find any juveniles of these species. It doesn't seem to be that this is some sort of um, nursery grounds. So we didn't record any juveniles of any of these species down there. Okay, so summarizing the fish data for the decipiens meadow, we found 38 species from 17 families, so a lot more diverse than what we saw for Hawaiiana. Okay. Rasses were the most diverse with 12 species followed by gobies. And as with the Hawaiiana site, density and abundance tended to be more, uh, tend to be greatest in the non-vegetated areas where there's just sand and rubble. Okay, and three recreationally important species were spotted in the area. Okay, I'm getting ready to move in, into the invertebrates, and this is the stuff that Atsuko Fukunaga uh, covered in her research. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions on fish? Yeah. Sure. Before we leave fish, sure. With uh, grain alcohol. Grain alcohol. Yeah. And the clove oil, it's just like an essential, just the clove oil? Just the clove oil. I get it from the uh, wild roots or whatever. It's just the, the same stuff that uh, you would. And the grain alcohol, so is that like a 10% solution? No, you could use like a 90 to 100% solution. So you could use <laughs> even vodka, it's pretty low proof. But you know, if you got an 80 proof, you're looking yeah. at 45. So if you've got 100% alcohol or 95% alcohol, use about 80% uh, of the alcohol to 20% clove oil. And how did you set up the, the station? That, how did you disperse it? And what does it do to the fish? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an analgesic, so it temporarily knocks them out. Um, so it's an anesthetic that you put this plastic tarp down somewhere, you kind of just haphazardly throw it. Where it lands, you spread it out to that 1.5 meter squared and you inject it from a bottle underneath the tarp. So everything that's down there in the sand or in the canopy itself that's hunkered down, all the small fishes, uh, get knocked out. And so then you see them kind of rolling around down there. And the tarp's clear, so you can see when you've collected some, you pull it up and scoop them up and, and, and pick them up in a net. Uh, so yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, works really, it works really well. It doesn't work as well as ichthyocides, but, but you do get some, some species that you would otherwise miss. Oh, that's a good question. By the health of the seagrass. Did, did we try to see whether the fish abundance or diversity uh, varied dependent on the health or lushness of the seagrass? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. No, I didn't look at anything like that. Again, I'm a fish person, so you know, Kim had to come down there and point out this is seagrass. And, um, so I, you know, I, I've learned a lot today as far as you know, uh, flowers and blades and things like that. Um, yeah. Is there any difference between the areas that aren't associated with the grass with the fish? Oh, comparing sandy area to sandy area. Um, depending on location, there could be definitely in the sandy areas that are around the sea tiger in the in the visual surveys. You're going to pick up a lot more species that are coming out from around the wreck. Whereas if you look at an isolated seagrass patch and the sandy area around that, say off the airport, uh, I bet you're going to get less species there in visual records. Um, again, we haven't done very many clove oil surveys down there, so it would be interesting to see whether there's a difference in the guys that are actually living in the sediment um, between the two sites. Okay. Are we? Yeah. In the algal world, we pay a lot of attention to endemic species. Mm -hmm. 
Silagobius mainlandi believes in an endemic species. I'm trying to think which other species I've talked about are endemic. Um, Simaludes, the razorfish, the one that occurs uh, over the uh, Halophila decipiens bed, is an endemic species, and we thought it was actually the only species of Simaludes that occurred in Hawaii. Uh, up until last summer, we were in Maui doing some of the same stuff on a uh, Halamita bed and spotted a uh, second species of Simaludes, uh, Simaludes pretextatus, that was not thought to occur in Hawaii, but, but now we know that the range does extend to Hawaii. Um, so there, there are several species uh, that are endemic, several species of cardinal fishes that we collect in some of the macroalgae beds as well that show up uh, in green leafy stuff. So um, yeah, I would say endemic species do occur and are important. And how many of those fish, if any, are grazing this event? That's an excellent question and, and one that I feared somebody was going to ask. Um, of the species that I've named so far uh, out there, none of those are going to be herbivorous to my knowledge. Some of them, in fact, probably are going out uh, and damaging uh, the seagrass blades incidentally. If they have any epiphytes on them, some of the wrasses will be going around and picking those off and probably causing some damage to the seagrass leaves. But the big herbivorous families that we don't see are blennies. Okay? No blennies are out there in any of these seagrass sites or the macroalgae sites. Um, and chubs, uh, the Nanui, if they're coming out along the Halophila Hawaiiana beds you know, at high tide, those would be important herbivores. Um, but otherwise, didn't see very many fish that, that, that could be potentially feeding on them. Okay. Anything else? Okay, on to inverts. Okay. A couple different species of neuterbranch or sea slugs. Okay. Uh, several different species of polychaetes, one of which you see here, a very large polychaete, uh, the bristle worm. Uh, several crabs that she saw on the surface. This is all just visual data. And most of it's coming from within the seagrass meadow itself. Also out there is one of our urchins, Trypneustes gratilla, and the auger, um, Teriba maculata. So there's several different types of invertebrates there from several different orders and several different families. Okay. But she concentrated primarily on the infall invertebrates, the small guys that are buried down in the sediment itself. So I'm going to talk about those next. Okay, now this graph is pretty busy here. Um, it contains a lot of information. But basically, it's two different sites that uh, Asuko and I looked at, the airport site and then the Sea Tiger site. And she divided the Sea Tiger site into port and starboard side of the sunken ship to see if there was a difference between the invertebrate fauna and the seaward side and in the leeward side. But for right now, just kind of lump these together for me. So airport and sea tiger. Okay. Lots of different taxa in here, lots of different types of invertebrates. Um, about 90% of the diversity and numbers of individuals was comprised of four different groups. So the annelids, the segmented worms, which you can see here include the polychaetes and the elagochaetes, so these bottom hashed bars. Okay. The nematodes or flatworms, and also the nematians, these guys up here. So 90% of the diversity in these sites was accounted for by these four large taxa. Okay, this just shows the end fauna diversity. Uh, these invertebrates are incredibly diverse um, and incredibly hard to identify. Generally, you need a specialist in a group to be able to identify some of these down to the species level. So this just, she breaks it down into the number of phylum in each of these areas. Okay, so for each site, airport and sea tiger, port and starboard, we have the sand and the canopy. Okay. So number of phylum did not really differ significantly between the sand and the canopy at any of the three sites. 